Well, I'm delighted to say that uh, joining me today on the Godcast is Brian Groom. Now, Brian is uh, a journalist who is an expert in British and uh, regional and national affairs, and he spent many years in journalism, working for the Financial Times, and was also the former editor of Scotland on Sunday. He now is um, a renowned author and has this fabulous new book out uh, called Northerners A History, We'll talk about that in a few moments. But, uh, Brian, it's lovely to welcome you to the Godcast. How are you? Uh, very well. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for inviting me. A pleasure. Brian, you, your book is about the Northerners, but, but are, are you are you based in the North yourself? Where's, where's home for Brian Groom? Yeah, yeah. Originally, originally I'm from Stretford, just southwest Manchester, but um, I've lived in lots of other places, London and Edinburgh mainly, um, recently, but... Um, my wife and I returned back north um, to live here in 2015, and we live in Saddleworth, uh, just northeast of Manchester in the South Pennines. Is, Good is walking the north, country. Yeah, absolutely. Is, is the north a place you yearn for when you weren't there? Was it always? Did it always have that kind of magnet to pull you home? Uh, absolutely, yes. I mean, I, I was. Oh, we were always visiting the north to visit relatives and friends um, whenever uh, there all the years of not living there. Um, but I always missed it, and um, and the plan was always when I, when I retired from my full time job, that um, that that we would move back north again. So we, we just did it. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, let's get down to business. Talk a bit about about the book and the north. Um, I suppose the first thing I would like to ask you, Brian, in in terms of your uh, political uh, career and experience. I've always, ever since this this term "leveling up" has been a thing in, <laughs> I don't know, it's like a new new genre, isn't it? That's been around for a couple of years, and I was wondering what what your thoughts were about about the differences between leveling up as a concept and leveling up as a reality. I was wondering if you could just break that down a little bit for us with your with your experience in in the field of politics. Um, well, I'm still trying to work out what it means, and um, we, was, we were in the process of trying to work out what it means under Boris Johnson, and then it kind of has been through two different versions since then, um, but um, we now have um, Michael Gove back in charge of it, so um, we're, we're back on the sort of lines we were originally. Um, it's still a bit ill-defined. Um, there are various definitions in the government white paper about what it means, um, but it's slightly vague and it's not entirely clear exactly what it's going to mean in practice. There are a few examples. There are various, there are a few financial schemes. The whole move to um, to try to move the English National Opera from London to Manchester potentially is can be seen as part of the levelling up agenda. But what it all adds up to yet, I think is still work in progress. Yeah, what what would what would you like it to mean, Brian, as a northerner? Um, you know, what would be your ideal? You know, well, I think I mean, if you, uh, I mean, in some respects, the I mean, some in some aspects, the the north has improved since the nineteen eighties, say, when the big cities were absolute basket cases, and I wouldn't have believed the extent to which cities such as Manchester and Leeds. And to some extent, Newcastle and the others um, have recovered from that low, um, but it's incomplete, and there are lots of areas um, that haven't regenerated. Some former mill towns, seaside towns, coal fields, places like that, and they they may need different kind of kind of um, policies. But what I think what what I think unites all successful regeneration efforts anywhere and we did see to some extent in the revival of the cities is you need cooperation between local politicians and the local business community and you also need a degree of buy-in from central government sometimes in some cases central government funds um and and this is our real weakness you need um programs that are designed to last for a long time we saw that in probably the most successful regeneration effort in Europe in um, modern times has been that of Eastern Germany. Um, they had a big solidarity tax in the early 1990s. Um, they created authorities at every level in Eastern Germany, and they've got these programs that have been running ever since. Uh, we tend to 
throw them out between not only just between governments, but when different prime ministers from the same government come in, um, everything the previous one did often just gets thrown out. So under David Cameron, we had um, we, we, we had um, various versions, the last one being the Northern Powerhouse, and that's kind of forgotten now. And we have various variants of levelling up. Yeah. And when we talk about the North-South divide, how, how I mean, I've lived in Burnley all my life, Brian, and, and I, I go down to London for Synod and, and occasionally, but how, how big is the Gulf? How big is the North-South divide, would you say? Um, I think it changes over time. Um, in some ways, you can see it culturally narrowing at the moment with first TV and radio and then um, um, kind of big chain stores, city centres that look the same wherever you are, globalisation, the internet and social media. We're all part of a bigger world. So in uh, in some respects, you see it narrowing and language differences have narrowed a bit. There's, um, uh, we're not all talking BBC English, but there is a <laughs> we'll talk variants of some kind of standard English. Um, but on the other hand, that, um, as I point out in the book, the economic divide has got grown pretty wide. It's um, they, they, in, in, economically, I think you can probably count the year 1911 as the um the, the north's high point when it had 36 and a half percent of england's population um but since then uh, it, it now has 27 and a half percent of england's population and there's an even bigger drop in its share of um uh of um britain's economic output from 30 percent just after the first world war to below 20 percent today so it's a big place but um in relative terms it's got a long way to go yeah and and talking about the book brian <clears throat> this is a book that's doing fabulously well at the moment um how how long has this book been in the making was this something you were thinking about while you were still working uh, or was it was it a, a, a labor of love when you retired? Just tell us a bit how the book actually came to be to be here now in hardback. Um, yeah, well, I, I first had the idea about ten years ago while I was still still working, and the the kind of background with me is that I was a, I was a history mad kid, uh, but then through various personal reasons, I went off it a bit in my late teens, and I did English at university. Uh, but I've come back to history a bit more as I've got older, as people often do, when you start to think about where you come from and who you're connected to. And second, uh, I was a, I was a journalist, and that's kind of like um, witnessing history in real time. Um, and I tended to specialise in regional and British affairs, and I'm a northerner. So if you put all those together, if you think of a book to do, it's an obvious idea to think of. And I was astonished to discover when I looked at it that it had only ever been done once before. There's only one previously published general history of Northern England, and that came out in 1990. So it seemed to me there's a there's a gap and an opportunity there. And regarding the book, Brian, was it where did you, what, the North is? Sorry, my dogs are on one. I'm going to pause this. <laughs> And um, this book is so full of history and information, um, uh, but the North's been around for a very long time. How, how did you, <laughs> how did you plan where to start the book? What, you know, what was your thinking? Where, where would be the the starting point for you? Well, I, obviously, I started by reading the one existing book that had done it, which was kind of quite old fashioned. It was a book called um, "The North of England" by a chap called Eric Musgrove, who was a retired education professor from Manchester University, a bit crusty, full of facts, some very good facts, um, but not many people and certainly no women. So that's a bit old fashioned. Um, and um, oh, where did I start? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I mean, what the, the kind of loose model I had in mind at the beginning was um, Peter Aykroyd's London, the biography, a very famous book came out 20 years ago that kind of follows the timeline of a city, but but it's it it's it, it wanders all over the place while it's doing so and tells you fascinating social and cultural things about the place. So I thought that kind of mix would work. Um, so there are lots of 
cross-cutting chapters on social and cultural themes like um, prominent Northern women and reformers, writers and artists, how the language divide developed, um, the story of the North's ethnic minorities and the importance of sheep. Um, um, but in, in the end, I ended up probably doing more narrative history than I'd expected. And that's partly because it's just a very compelling story. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to boil it, s s simplify it too much. And most people know, lots of people know bits of the story, parts of it, um, but probably haven't seen it put together, uh, how it fits into a, an overall pattern. Yeah, uh, you can't lead me up the garden path with talking about sheep and their importance. Just just expand <laughs> on that a bit, Brian. Tell us how and why sheep were so important. And perhaps uh, the really, well, it kind of groups two two things to get together. The um, medieval um, uh, woolen industry focused on uh, mostly Cistercian abbeys in Yorkshire and elsewhere, um, who kind of industrialized the raising of sheep, which had been done in small numbers before. They turned it into a complete industry. They uh, great. Um, they employed what were known as lay brothers, which we now would call gig economy workers, uh, to look after their sheep. And um, they raised them for their wool, and the wool got shipped to other abbeys in the Low Countries that specialized in um, turning it into cloth. Mm -hmm. And then I move on through how <clears throat> the industry evolved, and it just tells the the story of the of, of the industrial revolution and the woolen industry in Yorkshire yeah. and other places. Yeah. So that's 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 pretty much what the, what the sheep does, and it, what it plays into is one big thing about the history of the North and the North South divide is um, historians sometimes talk about uh, England as being divided into a highland zone and a lowland zone. I mean, it's a bit, it's an oversimplification because there are arable areas in the north, like the Vale of York and the Northumbrian Plain. But broadly, north and west of a what is known as the Jurassic Divide, a stretch of Jurassic rock that stretches from Dorset up to the Yorkshire coast, north and west of it, you tend to get higher ground, hills and mountains, um, thinner soils suitable for raising sheep particularly um in some places cattle as well that's where the sheep come in and um it was a different development pattern from places south and east of that which tended to have richer farmland suitable for growing arable crops and north in the north and the west you tended to get isolated farmsteads and small hamlets forming South and East, you've got larger villages forming and generally wealthier through most of history. Yeah. Um, so there's evidence of things like pottery emerging much earlier in the South and East than there is in the North and West. So these things all all tie together. Yeah, it's all fascinating stuff. Now, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm working my way through the book, but there are there are <clears throat> three things that I just wanted to pick up on, really. Well, the first one was that you write, really lovely about uh, Bede and Hilda in Northumbria. What was your attraction to writing about those? I mean, as a as a priest, I can see the attraction, but what was the fascination in, in that story to tell to tell their their way in life? Um, well, I think it was partly because I I knew less about that period than about some of the more modern periods. I'd never studied the history of the Kingdom of Northumbria, so it was all new to me. And um all, all fascinating and uh, you can see it i think as a, to me it appeals it's, it's the the north's main high point aside from the industrial revolution the industrial revolution it influenced the whole world economically but not so much politically but the kingdom of northumbria it was for a short period um um northern europe's leading intellectual artistic and christian center and it had transformed itself uh, into that in less than a century from an illiterate uh, pagan society. So it was a very, very rapid chain, rapid and fantastic change. And and it it, it, it kind of ties into the modern day as, as well in that, um, um, you know, if it's one of the great what-ifs of history. If it had lasted longer, perhaps uh, the North will be part of a kind of um, very different kind of Britain ruled from the North rather than one be a more outlying region of one governed from the south. And and, and did did that uh, exploration of be did you did you venture up to Holy Island and and places like Durham and and and, and Whitby to 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 learn and feel 
uh, kind of, I've, I've just recently returned on a pilgrimage, you know, to walk in the footsteps of these these people. Um, um, not while writing the book, but we ha actually I did do a, 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 a walked um, uh, Oswald's Way about five years ago, which is uh, gets you to Lindis Farm by walking across the sands, and I've been to Whitby um, several times. Um, um, uh, but one of the irony people people say to me, you, you must have traveled all over the place to write this book. Actually, while I was working the book, I was sitting in a seat <laughs> reading books. I was traveling nowhere because I had to get on with it. Um, you know, in a sense, one of the joys of what's happened afterwards is I've got book to talk in quite a lot of pieces right across the north. So I've got to visit all the places I was writing yeah. about and learn a bit more about them. Yeah, yeah. And the other the other uh thing that i've picked up from the book uh and probably it comes as no surprise as being a burnley guy is this this cotton industry that that was kind of reached extraordinary levels quite quickly didn't it but then it then it collapsed quite quickly as well what what are your reflections on on, on that period of 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 time for the north yes in a way it um it, it... It had a kind of Ill illusion of um, security in the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. Um, people thought it was such a great industry that nothing could damage it. Um, then the First World War came along and um, India in particular, which had been a massive market, started making its own textiles and other countries, several other countries have started getting into it, or particularly in Asia in the late 19th century um um so a series of, and and then the slump coming after that so you're right it did it did then start to decline pretty steeply though it wasn't until i think it was uh, it's in the book so i think it was not until the late 70s that um um that we started becoming a net importer of cotton textiles for the first time since the industrial revolution so it took a little bit of a while yeah, it's quite um, it's quite fascinating for me, as as I say, from being from Burnley. I, I hear, you know, I do do funeral services and, and speaking to some of the more elderly members of the community. You know, and the, there was somebody who recently told me who they there's a there's a high point in Burnley called called Crown Point where there is a a wonderful a sculpture called the Singing Ringing Tree. And um, this gentleman was telling me how he used to go up to that point and he'd look across. Burnley, where he could, he counted, I think he said he counted 85 chimneys and, and industrial chimney pots at, at that as well. Um, and he was kind of lamenting how that industry had, had collapsed. And and I suppose one of the uh, legacies of all that is that the buildings, many of the buildings remained and, and in parts of, parts of Burnley and Nelson and Colton, there are still many mill places that have either been converted into flats and thinking about places like Ancoats as well in Manchester, where this huge regeneration program has taken place. Um, I just wondering, you know, do, do you think that, you know, we, we're now kind of a world of digital manufacturing, if that's the right word, you know, Burnley's become a plethora of boohoo, uh, super outlets and, 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 and factories kind of thing. Do you think we'll ever see an industrial period again, in the UK, Brian, as I've just witted on about there, do you, or do you think that day is gone forever? Well, probably not to the extent anything like the extent it once was. I mean, the up to the pandemic, the 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 decline of British manufacturing had had bot bottomed out. Really, it had um, at one time it was more than half the British economy, um, but it, over the past 10, 15 years, been stable at around ten percent. Um, and there's been some modest reshoring, as they call it, of, of um, production from Asia. Uh, manufacturing is going through a particularly tough time at the moment with the, um, the inflation and cost of living crisis and various cost crises. Um, so it's not. So I don't know what the outcome of that is. But there are hopes um, that the North in particular um, we'll be able to capture some of the um, the so-called green industries. That's the big big hope of many. Um, but it's not, you know, there are competitors, and it's not easy to do. Like an attempt to establish a big um, car battery factory in Northumberland seems to be foundering at the moment. So it's not a it's not a given that can do that. But it is there is an, a, some opportunity 
um, to get a bit more manufacturing. And, and also the, the other factors like uh, more difficult relations with China. I mean, companies think twice about concentrating all their production in China. Um, uh, things like 3D printing give you the opportunity for sort of manufacturing things in small batches closer to home. Um, so it's it's not certain by any means, but I wouldn't rule out a sort of some kind of mini revival of of manufacturing. And, and when you wrote your your book, Brian, what 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 surprises did it reveal to you as an individual? You know, those were there some kind of wow moments for you as you were doing the research that you thought, wow, I just never knew that. What what were the real highs of writing a book? I mean, you know, I've written a book myself. It, it's 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 tough going at times, isn't it? But but there are also these times of kind of euphoria and great joy. What what were what were they for you? Um, well, I think the thing that surprised me most was reading about the extent of of Lancashire's working class conservative voting pattern, uh, which I knew a little bit about before, but I hadn't really thought about it. It's quite a quite a phenomenon. And the um, and that took me into things like the history of I mean, some of it's much debated what might have caused this, but it's quite predominant. There was a lot, a lot more Lancashire working class people voted Tory than in the North East or in Yorkshire. Um, historically, and it w was right in right until the late twentieth century. Um, a lot of it's probably got to do with hostility to Irish Catholic immigration. Uh, certainly, the case in Liverpool, and um, um, it's it, it, reading about Liverpool's history. It was it actually became dominated by the Conservative Party from eighteen forty one right until the nineteen seventies. Well, that's kind of been airbrushed out of history. It's not something that people think of anymore about Liverpool. Uh, so that was quite a surprise and fascinating to, to go into. It's quite interesting because Bur Burnley has got a lot of residual conservative uh, uh, clubs around the place. And, and I've often thought, gosh, there's a lot of conservative clubs around Burnley, considering that it is a, a Labour voting town. But then, but, but moving that on a little bit, Brian, when we think about Lancashire in terms of Brexit you know and we look at Burnley and, and Burnley uh, not only did did it, it lose its Labour seat which is for the first time in well decades and decades that it also was a, a very um, uh, strong vote in favour of Brexit I was just wondering why why you feel as a historian why you feel that people you know many northern um, Lancashire towns, Yorkshire towns, uh, moved away from the Labour Party and 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 actually moved away from the idea of a European Union and became Brexiteers. What what's your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, if you look deeper into history, it, uh, the North often likes to think of itself as a radical area. You know, the home of the where the Labour Party was created, the home of causes like the Chartists and. Um, in the 20th century, the uh, the suffragettes and all, all these kind of things. But there's also a, a strong conservative strand in its history, a social conservative strand in its history, particularly before the Industrial Revolution when it was a more rural place. Um, and um, we saw it in the, particularly in the Tudor era with a couple of major revolts against uh, central government policy, which was basically, and basically they they um, they were opposed to the Reformation and feared for changes to their kind of traditional ways and values of doing things, as well as the abolition, Henry VIII's abolition of the monasteries. Um, and if you look at the during the civil wars as well, the the royalists tended to get their support from northern and western England, which are more rural and conservative. Whereas Parliament tend to get its support from London and the South East and the emerging towns and cities, which is similar to the pattern we saw in the, the Brexit referendum. So it's not it's not completely new in terms of the North's history. And it's now even the 20th century, it's never been a sort of Labour monolith. It's been because it, what people call the Red Wall is a uh, uh, it's a well a, a, tightly defined. It's places that Labour held for a long time but there are some places that are that have been marginals that have changed hands a few times that often get lumped in with it as well um, and it shouldn't be a complete surprise because um, 
the North had a higher no vote than the rest of the country in the 1975 EU referendum. And to some extent, some of it's it's um, explicable through demographics. Um, Brexit in 2016 tended to be more popular among older voters and non-graduates, and the North has a higher proportion of those than other regions do. Um, um, but it's true that it was a factor in those red wall seats that went and it's affecting politics now. I'm sure it's a driving factor in why um, Keir Starmer is um, talking about um, not going back to any any um, um, uh, free movement of labour uh, within the um, with, uh, uh, aligned with the EU. Yeah. So it's, it's all fascinating stuff, Brian. But I'm, I'm conscious of time. But I, I do want to just touch on on an area that I, um, in your book, which is the Victorian period. And and as somebody who uh, got a real affinity with seaside towns, I think it was probably because my my parents brought me up on summer season entertainment. But 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 the the history of uh, places like Blackpool, you know, I see uh, see Victorian images of you know the the seafront being absolutely crammed with people. And elephants bathing in the sea from the circus, you know, and um, that was an extraordinary period of time as well, wasn't it? Where, you know, uh, that the still has a legacy of of people coming down from Scotland for their holidays. But, but the 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 decline of of uh, you, you touched on it at the beginning of the interview. The decline of of seaside towns has been quite stark, and and there are I suppose there are green shoots of recovery in in certain places, but there's still there's still a real kind of there's a lot of work to do in these places, isn't there? Uh, there is, yes, yes. And uh, the seaside towns in particular, a lot of it stems from the growth of foreign holidays in the 1970s and 1980s. I mean, Blackpool was doing pretty well until the 1990s, really. It's only the last, it's mainly the last 20, 25 years that it's struggled more. Um, and um, as you say, its growth was absolutely spectacular from the late um, late 19th century. It was a sea bathing spot for the wealthy, um, but suddenly they were um, um, during the later nineteenth century. Um, average real wages were rising, and people were starting to get a bit of leisure time. So that's why you started to see the growth of things like the music hall and the seaside, um, and it coincided with the coming of the railways, which brought um, day trippers and travellers from all over the north and. As you say, from Glasgow and the Midlands to um, to Blackpool, um, so that became its golden era. And in fact, its 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 um, number of visitors carried on growing after the First World War. So even even to the late nineteen nineteen thirties. And one of the, one of the fascinating things I did get into in the in the book was interesting to learn about was that though everyone thinks of the nine the twenties and thirties as being a really tough time for the North in many ways, many parts of it uh, it was particularly. Tyneside. But if you if you had a job, uh, things were improving. And um, there's a great divide. And then people in employment were getting rising real wages and paid holidays coming along and the growth of white collar and middle class occupations. A lot of new, you'll probably all know them, lots of new suburbs started being created in the 1920s and 30s. So these all of these periods are more mixed than you think they are. Yeah, it, it, it's it's fascinating that because um, there's a there's a, a working steam mill in Burley called the Queen Street Mill, and I was interested to learn about the people that worked there. They they weren't badly paid. They were they were they were they were rewarded quite well for for the day's work that they did, and and that 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 surprised me somewhat. And um, it's interesting to to make to hear you say that about 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 that period of time. And 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 looking forward, Brian. I mean, this is a this is a deep well of material, isn't it? Are, are you are you working on a new one? Have you got plans for another one? Uh, what what's your your thoughts there? I am I'm working on another one. I can't say publicly what it's going to be yet. There's going to be an announcement in the new year, probably. Uh, all I can say is I'm, I'm already behind with it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and um, and the response it, 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 is it is it being what you expected? Has it been more? Um, you know the the joy of having your book published. Just tell us about the the personal feeling that and sat, feeling of satisfaction that you've got from that. 
Uh, well, great. I mean, um, I, 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 di I didn't think I was guaranteed to get it published at all. Um, I was, I think, fortunate that um, Harper North, this our, our, both our publisher, this new Manchester-based imprint of Harper, Harper Collins, came along just at the right point when um, when I was looking for a publisher. My my big fear all along was that um, it would be seen as too local for the national and international publishing market, and yet at the same time not local enough for um, the specialist local history, local interest press. There's not not many books about the North as a whole ever get published, and most of the ones that do are slightly, slightly quirky personal quirky personal memoirs. Mm. So so it wasn't wasn't guaranteed, um, but I always thought that. That if I get into people's hands, it's a, just such an interesting story that so that deserves to be told and isn't often told. I certainly I didn't think expect it to do as well as it has been doing, and it's been very gratifying. And um, it's pleasing that 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 and that that, that that people find it readable enough because I'm dead. the whole aim was to try to make something that's accessible to general readers, but. Um, is sufficiently intellectually rigorous um, not to get into trouble with academics. Yeah, <laughs> and with and with the new book, Brian, are you are you exploring uh, new new ideas, or are you, are you digging deeper into some of the, the the stories that you've uncovered already, or a bit of both? Uh, there, are, there are there are actually two books in the in the pipeline. One is more completely new, and one is going deeper into some aspects of the things I've already uh, to some extent been looking at yeah yeah okay well here it is let's give it another plug it's it's a northern as a history from the ice age to the present day it's by brian groom it's published by uh our friends at harper north and uh you know i think it it's uh, it's not too late to go out and get a christmas present it, it's really fascinating it's got something in there for everyone so uh i would highly recommend it brian brian thanks very much for coming on on the Godcast, it's lovely to meet you. I've seen you on social media and whatnot, and um, uh, continued success with the book. And, and thank you for coming on the Godcast. Thanks, Alex. I've enjoyed it.